Earlier this month, we released a market study confirming that AI and digital were among the biggest COVID-19 response strategies, and they will be pivotal to strategies for modernizing the contact center moving forward. Next month, we'll release a market study confirming that customers are more confident and comfortable than ever in those digital environments. These statistics are encouraging. They're showing the realization of the omnichannel movement. They're confirming that after all the hype and after all the discussion, we finally have the ability to scale customer centricity and meet customers wherever they are. That said, while it's great to see this resounding support for digital communication, none of this data eliminates the importance of the phone. Customers continue to view voice as their absolute top option for serious issues. They also want it to be a valuable escalation measure whenever they hit a snag in digital, whether that's for a serious issue or just something transactional. So to put it simply, digital is a complement, not a replacement to the voice experience. And as we work to modernize our contact center and really build a true omni-channel experience, we want to make sure we're accepting this reality. But accepting the reality does not mean we have to accept everything exactly as it is. There's a reason phone has caught some flack in the past. There are issues where you don't trust the outbound calls you're receiving if you're a customer. There's notorious delays associated with the phone call process. And this leads to less than stellar experiences and lower than ideal conversion rates. At a time when we need to communicate important information or facilitate valuable engagement with our customers, we cannot allow these problems to linger. So rather than looking at phone as kind of this static, old faithful, and digital as the shiny new toy, why don't we take a more blended approach? Recognize that phone is still important and always will be, but then use new technology to make it better, to make it more efficient, to make it more customer centric. And that is what we're gonna do today. Our speaker is gonna reveal ways to improve trust in the phone call process so that you can deliver timely messages, achieve higher engagement, and build the relationships with your customers that we really want. Because when you do that, that's when you're modernizing the service experience. That's when you're building a true omni-channel journey. So I'm thrilled for today's discussion. And with that, I want to introduce our speaker, Craig Dunn from First Orion. Craig, how's everything going? Uh, everything's going great, Brian. I, I know we're all trying to live in uh, this new world and uh, it, it probably making the phone channel even more important uh, is, is we're all staying home more and trying to get everything done from there. But uh, thanks for the setup. I mean, it, it's a great topic and very excited to be here today to uh, talk about some of the new developments. Definitely. I'm thrilled for you know, a nice interactive discussion here. We're not going to bombard anyone with slides or anything. We just really want to have a nice chat about this topic. But before we get there, I want to give people some context. So, so, Craig, what do you do with First Orion and what is First Orion kind of more broadly? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm the chief revenue officer, which means I'm the first guy that gets fired if we're not successful. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, really what we do is have a, a, a focus in a couple of really large areas. One of the foundations of the company was stopping uh, some of the problems in the phone channel uh, that's made it very difficult for brands to use. And one of those is all the unwanted calls that we received. Uh, virtual takeover by scammers, not a lot different than what happened in the email channel in the early days. And so our first step as First Orion was to put technology in the marketplace that stopped that. Uh, great announcement out by T-Mobile, we're integrating their network and they just made a large uncarrier move that frankly is driven by our technology. So rather than me talk about that a lot, that's something that's discoverable and folks can go out and see um, this past week in an announcement. Then our next move was to do something you just talked about, Brian, is to take the phone call and bring it into this digital omni-channel experience that we all want for our customers uh, to really be, make it visual, branded, actionable, customized, programmatically driven. Those are the things that make omni-channel work. And there are large companies out there, you know, I just spent a little bit of time this last week uh, with looking at Adobe and they really take that experience and they make it the same on the web, in the store, uh, on the mobile phone, all of those things. And the phone call is just that last missing piece of an omni-channel digital strategy that got left out uh, over the last decade. And our technology really takes that and makes it visual, branded, customizable, program programmatically driven. And that's, that's something that sounds uh, 
fantastic. And I got to tell you, the, the technology behind it's really complex, but how effective it is is very, very simple. Great, and that's great context here. So what I wanna kind of structure our conversation on is first and foremost, just understanding where we are from an omni-channel perspective and where phone fits into that. And you've already kind of alluded to that nicely and I wanna follow up there. Then I wanna dive into kind of what some of the big trust challenges are, the things we need to be mindful of, given that we're accepting phone will have a continued role in the customer contact process. I specifically also wanna look at how COVID-19 has perhaps accelerated the need to A, address those trust challenges and B, create more opportunities for phone conversations. And then C, I wanna kind of get at your vision as we close up, your vision for the contact center, how you see that ultimate harmony between using digital channels for some conversations and voice for others. So that should be a nice conversation as we wrap up today of CCW Online. So starting with the first portion. So you guys are on the phone space, so you're probably biased, but I'm gonna challenge you, prove to me, prove to our audience why voice still has a, an enduring place in our customer contact journey. Yeah, and, and it's great that this is a conversation, Brian, and, and we're not, you know, using a lot of graphics and slides. And, uh, you know, I could point to a lot of surveys that are out there that say um, that, and you mentioned it uh, in the intro, there are a lot of use cases where people prefer the phone. If it's something complex, right, if it's something that is not a couple of sentences that you can handle in a chat bot, uh, if it's something that would require five minutes of conversation and with the way our brains process, that's probably a 10 page email. Uh, people like that voice contact. Uh, if it's customer service related, uh, if it's involving um, a, a big purchase, if it's involving uh, resolving uh, issues, uh, even customer initiated um, type activity. So think about when you go out and, and maybe you use your American Express card. Uh, by the way, I sent a note to the to the the CEO of American Express and said, "Hey, you should run ads during COVID that say American Express card. Don't stay home without it, right?" So, and you said it. We're staying at home, but we're we haven't cut off our economic lives. We're buying. We're still trying to resolve delivery issues, and delivery issues are growing. That last mile of connecting with a customer, whether it's bringing them a dishwasher from Home Depot or a meal from DoorDash uh, or, or whatever it might be, uh, it's creating more and more issues where time is of the essence and nothing better is out there is, is in terms of a contact channel for quickness than the phone, a phone call and the ability to talk to someone that can help you with your issue. So it's interesting because our research has historically shown the same thing. We asked customers last year in our consumer survey, why do you choose to call? And the number one answer was exactly what you said, speed. There's also an accountability component as well, where when you're talking to someone on the phone, you can kind of yell at them, expect them to do something, whereas you don't have that yeah. same power in a digital conversation, let alone if you're talking to a chatbot or something like that. But speed is a big part of it. But interestingly enough, a lot of aspects of voice are notoriously slow. And that's where I think we have a lot of momentum behind digital because we think of the biggest pain points in the journey, the repeating your information, even knowing that you're talking to the right person, waiting on hold while they look stuff up. These are all notorious phone challenges. So it's kind of ironic in that customers choose phone for speed, yet oftentimes get very slow and cumbersome experiences. So walk us through kind of some of these challenges you see, why phone maybe isn't always delivering on that promise for a fast and efficient interaction. Yeah, I'll spend a few minutes on that, Brian. One of the things that happened, uh, obviously, I think to, for most people is businesses tried to, to drive down their cost in that phone channel. So uh, all of a sudden we were talking to machines, we had complicated IVRs, uh, we had less people that could answer the phone. Uh, we started getting long wait times and asking if we wanted callbacks. Uh, normal things that happen in business, right? People thought of the phone as a mature channel and they started driving the cost down. Uh, but then you started seeing brands waking up to the, the cost of driving down the customer experience in that channel. Uh, and I'll give you a great example. T-Mobile uh, over the last two years made a really big change in how they were investing in the phone channel for customer service. Uh, that may seem intuitive. You know, it's a phone company. Of course they invest in the phone channel. Uh, but really, most customer service, if you uh, have a phone, most of you do, uh, and you have problems with it, you call in and you get the same experience as you do with companies that aren't in the phone channel, 
right? You get lo long wait times, callbacks, those sort of things. T-Mobile decided to go out and invest in groups of people who are waiting for you to call with a customer service problem. And their goal was to solve your problem without handing you off to someone who didn't know all the information. Just like you said, what a terrible experience. I talk to someone, I tell them everything, and the next person says, repeat all of that. So one of the things that really, really empowered that, though, is think about this, Brian. They would get a phone call, and if they couldn't resolve the, the question or the request or they didn't have enough people to talk, they said, can we call you back? Guess how many people, even though they called in and said, I want to talk, answered that phone call when they got the phone call back? I won't make you guess. It was 34%. So someone called and said, I want help and I want to talk, but I didn't answer your call when you called back. And, and you talked about it, Brian, that's because of the problems in the phone channel. We all got used to a lot of people calling us that we didn't want to talk to. Scammers got very sophisticated. Our handset would show us something like an 800 number and even legitimate businesses started acting like scammers. So if you didn't answer my 800 number, I'd call you on a area code and prefix that looks just like your phone number. So maybe you would think I was a friend. <laughs> that, that was calling you about going out for pizza. Um, and so all of that really got us kind of numb to answering the phone or trusting that phone channel. But let me tell you what T-Mobile did. They turned on this technology that when the phone rang, it told the customer who they are and why they were calling. They demonstrated that we know who you are and we know what your problem is. And that 34% answer rate jumped up to more like 80 and 90%. So we could probably end the call here, right? When you say contact center, one of the important words in that is contact. And that's, that, that is more about, uh, in this channel, the customer wanting to be contacted than it is the business's desire to contact them. And that's, that's really the problem that this technology is resolving. Yeah, and it's, it's speaking of the irony. So I talked about the irony of we prefer phone for speed, and yet historically phone interactions haven't been fast. The same goes with the idea of calling back. So we ask customers, hey, customers in theory love the idea of callback support. It's one of their top kind of perks. They would love to not have to wait on hold to just get a call back when things are convenient. They yeah. love the idea of just outreach and proactive care in general. Again, if you save them the chance of having to look up a phone number, wait on hold, go through an IVR, and you just are ready with an answer for them, that's all great in theory. But then like you said, in practice, we're running into a challenge where customers reject these calls, they don't trust them, and therefore they're missing out on the benefit. They end up having to go through all the additional effort of having to look up the number and send inbound calls. Meanwhile, the organization is losing all this cost on, that they're spending on these outbound campaigns and missing out. So I wanna start there, kind of at the broader trust challenge that you alluded to. What can organizations start to do to make outbound calls more trustworthy, let customers know, hey, here's why we're getting in touch, here's who we are, and therefore ultimately give customers what they say they want, but eliminate all the stuff that they don't want. Yeah, uh, thanks for asking, Brian. And I, I don't want to turn this into just a commercial about First Orion. Uh, it's really more about the consumer experience. And, you know, you said something important there, Brian. We spend all this money and we spend time thinking about customer journeys and we really want customers to engage in, with our brand in, in an emotional way. Because uh, we know that when we can engage with customers in an emotional way and we create joy and a good experience, then, then we create a great lifetime value of, with, with a customer. In the phone channel, we turned off all the emotion, right? We, we call them, we make them, even when we call, we, you answer the phone, it's like wait for someone to actually be a live person on the phone. Uh, we have those long wait times and then we have this fraud issue. Uh, so uh, although I said I don't want to turn it into a commercial, we develop technology that really does change, take the display of a phone and, and bring it into a digital experience for the consumer when the phone rings, right? So the phone begins ringing, and I don't know about you, Brian, but I don't answer a lot of phone calls, but one thing I always do when my phone rings, I look at it. And what, what this allows a brand to do is to take that space and say, hey, Brian, it's me calling. I'm, it's Home Depot. I'm calling about your, uh, your dishwasher delivery. When you give the customer enough information that, to know that you know them intimately, that by itself creates trust. Uh, and I could go into a lot of technical reasons about why this new technology is hard to interrupt. Uh, 
it's it's impervious to scammers and all those things but the way you really create trust is you let somebody know that you know them it's the same way you do it in relationships your personal relationships right i've been married for 38 years and uh, the, you know one of the things i learned in in that journey that i've had is that uh, it, is knowing someone is is probably the best way to establish trust so I, I promise you, I don't pick up my wife for a Friday night, date night, and take her to a restaurant she's told me she doesn't like. But we do that with customers all the time, especially in the phone channel. Yeah, and I think you hit on what I alluded to in my intro, which is the idea that it's not voice versus new technology. It's not even voice versus digital technology. It's voice is one communication option, text is another. And why not use technology, including digital technology, including mobile friendly technology to make all those better. So what you're describing here is you're using a lot of the benefits that you get from the mobile environment, the visual cues, the clear, concise information, speaking to people on the devices that they prefer to use, you're just giving them then the option to talk as opposed to texting. And it certainly seems like you're then using technology to create a better experience, not kind of fragmenting this difference between voice and text. Yeah, we're, we are doing that. And, and here's something really important, Brian, is, and you just said it, is we're communicating information via the voice channel that doesn't require you to talk. So think about getting that call that we were talking about. Maybe it's from Home Depot and you're at work in the middle of a business meeting and you can't answer, but you glanced at your handset and in about two seconds, you realize the brand calling you and why they're calling, right? So now you can take that offline. Maybe you move over and start chatting now. Uh, maybe you jump on a website and communicate with them, uh, especially if, if they're not you know, able to find your home or they're trying to call you and, and somebody else in your family is, is sitting at home waiting for that delivery. So it, it, you said it, it's really taking that voice channel and using it to communicate a lot more information and to put the action in the hands of the consumer. So think about if you're in that business meeting and, and your phone pops up an 800 number, you don't answer it and you probably don't rush out of that meeting to listen to maybe a voicemail that got left behind. You just assume it's part of all of that noise that you've been getting for the last four or five years that you really don't want on your phone to begin with. And so being able to, to communicate and really bring that sort of full omni-channel digital experience to that handset at a point of action is, is really, really powerful. Yeah, so I think just the notification, the explaining who they are and why they're calling, that's going to automatically add trust. But let's face it, I can tell that with text messages. I can tell that with emails. And I still have gotten to the point where I'm ignoring a lot of messages because I just know that I don't really care. I feel like brands maybe abuse the fact that they have my phone number and my email address. And I'd imagine the same could prove true. Even if you're using great kind of identification technology where you can establish who you are and why you're calling, it doesn't mean every issue, frankly, should be a phone call. It doesn't mean you have to hit your customer up with every single thing you want to call about. So thinking more from the technology, taking a step away from the technology for a second and moving to the strategy, just to build more trust in that if you're a brand and you're going to call the customer, they know it's important. What are some best practices for deciding what warrants a call versus perhaps what doesn't need any contact, let alone a phone call? Yeah, well, the biggest thing, Brian, is don't abandon all of your experience. You know, don't ignore all of your analytics. Uh, listen to the voice of the consumer, right? We all spend a lot of money to figure out uh, what kind of email to send and how many to send. Uh, I know we're working with a company right now who has a very strict policy. They only allow themselves to email their customers once a month. So they put a lot of thought into that communication because they know over communicating is a problem. No different for the phone channel. Don't call them too much. Uh, try to learn their contact or uh, communication preferences and use that. Um, so I, I really mean when we talk about bringing that phone call into the digital uh, omni-channel experience, you got to make it part of that ecosystem. So you can't forget all your other learnings and go, hey, this is great. Let's call Brian with a lot of pretty pictures a lot. <laughs> it's just not how it works. Uh, but you got to demonstrate to that customer uh, value and trust outside of just making that phone call. But when you bring that into that, that corral where you've been doing all of those things right, then you start getting things like two and 300% times the results in the phone channel than you got before. And that's not an exaggeration, Brian. We have lots of use cases with lots of brands who are, are driving a lot more people answering the phone. More importantly, what I would call conversion, 
the reason the business is calling the customer is happening more often, whether it's resolving a customer service, getting to a delivery there, um, answering a question, those results are going up two or 300%. And I don't know of any technology out there or any other channel where you can get that immediate impact by just doing something that is, is a little bit new and meets the customer where they want to be met at. Now, I, want, I know this event isn't purely a COVID response event. You know, that was a big focus of our last online event, but let's face it, we're still very much in that scenario right now and still has an impact. And it especially has an impact over two things we're talking about right now. First of all, why you might need to call because it's a new world out there. There's new kinds of conversations we're having. And I'd imagine some of those are best handled via phone call. The second thing is trust. We heard in our last event, and I think it's again, common sense that when you have a lot of craziness and chaos and uncertainty in the marketplace, that fuels the opportunity first for fraud and for scams and for just abuse of customer data and that sort of thing. So from your perspective, when you look at what's going on in the world right now, how does that necessitate a closer look at one, the kind of calls we need to be having and two, the importance of really developing and cultivating customer trust within these interactions? Yeah, well, I, I know one of the things I thought uh, wouldn't happen again in my lifetime, Brian, is that uh, we want to talk more. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's uh, as we see people become more isolated, uh, you know, really working from home more, uh, not even having the interactions maybe that they had in the past with their coworkers, uh, certainly, you know, very much uh, not out and about in entertainment venues. Uh, whether it's sporting or dining and those type of things. Uh, connecting with people on an emotional level uh, in your business is extremely important. And there's just a human quality that comes with voice that doesn't happen any other way. Uh, we can communicate excitement and disappointment. And you said it earlier, Brian, sometimes you just need to let your customers register their disappointment so that they can abandon that and let you hopefully bring them a great experience again. Um, so that's very, very important, and voice really does that extremely well. Uh, and this trust issue is really simple. You know, we're, we, we've seen out in the marketplace that about 90% of business calls just don't get answered. Uh, that's not because customers don't trust businesses. They just stop trusting that voice channel. Uh, so having a technology that will, will communicate to the customer that, that you are who you say you are is almost as important if you think about the contact center space is knowing that the customer calling into a contact center is that person, right? We, we want to stop the, the individual uh, people from taking the identity of consumers. So the, the industry spent a lot of money on trust and verification of the inbound call. So think about this technology doing the same for the business to consumers, restoring the fact of the trust of who's calling and why they're calling is just as important when you're outbound calling as it is for a business when they're getting that inbound call to make sure the customer is who they say they are, they have the ability to transact with me, and they're not taking over Brian's account for some nefarious purpose. Now, one of these things are when we hear about any sort of technology, whether it's really the security or customer data or anything that's going to make it so that we can demonstrate more recognition of who the customer is and why they're getting in touch or why we're getting in touch, it sounds great, but we often forget that there's another step there, right? There's the repositioning our agents, our employees to be comfortable in that environment. If a lot of our agents are used to an environment where they take for granted, they're not gonna know who they're talking to or why they're talking to until they ask. Well, in this case, if you're calling and saying, hey, we're Home Depot, as you brought up earlier, and we're calling about this delivery that we have scheduled for Friday, when the customer picks up, I'd imagine the agent has to operate with that kind of knowledge as well if they don't know, hey, this is why I'm calling and this is exactly what we're talking about, it kind of makes the entire thing fall flat. So when you look at maybe some uh, from a systemic standpoint or from a training standpoint, what is that next operational step you have to take to ensure that when customers do pick up, they're getting the better phone experience they're expecting? Yeah, my, most of your audience will, will get this. I think, uh, Brian, uh, the, the industry spent a lot of money to educate agents, right? Uh, in the way our technology works, it's very API driven. So the, the, the outbound information that's showing up on a handset to a consumer, uh, 
uh, is driven with intelligence, uh, with real-time APIs, that same technology can drive that information into the agent as well, right? So what you don't wanna have is a really rich display that says, I know who you are and I know what your needs are. And then you get a human on the phone that doesn't know any of that. <laughs> so it's very important to, to connect this into your whole ecosystem. So if you have the ability to uh, push that information out to the consumer and, to the, and you are already informing your agents of information, is make sure that those uh, that those pieces of information are married together, uh, and you can do that. And, and the technology has made it a lot easier to do that. But you don't want to do one without the other. Um, and and I think what you mentioned is very very important. Don't promise a rich experience and then disappoint when they pick up the the phone with the agent. Well, yeah, and there's also uh, obviously the data thing. I think you have to take for granted. There's also the training cool. aspect as well, and that it just. Yeah it's a different kind of conversation that not all agents are prepared for. That said, what I see as an advantage of right now, part of the reason why we can't train agents on some of the more human conversational skills is because we're so bogged down and here's how you look up records in the system. Here's how you navigate through 50 yeah. different knowledge bases. The more we can do to centralize that information, the more time we have to coach agents on what really matters in the interaction. And so, yes, I would imagine that for some organizations, it is going to be a little bit of a learning curve going from just answering calls, kind of tabula rasa from a blank slate situation, yeah. and then going into where you're actually having a conversation that's driven, pointed, and based on real information. But when you simplify systems on the back end, you're going to give yourself more time to make that happen. Yeah, no, you really nailed it, Brian. I, if you think back to when the iPhone first debuted, right, only a decade ago, it seems like we've had it in our lives forever. But there was a lot of concern that people would take it out of the box. There's no keyboard. There's not very many buttons. It's going to be very difficult, but it was intuitive. And the great thing about call enhancement, to the consumer, it's intuitive, right? They just see a display on their phone and it communicates this information and it lets them know what to do. So, so a lot of what we do at First Orion is help businesses adopt that technology because what you're talking about is not easy, right? We find businesses that have lots of use cases for calls. Uh, one of the reasons I'm using Home Depot right now is I'm spending a lot of time at home and my wife's been watching way too much HGTV. So I'm painting things, I'm, I'm redoing some woodwork and I'm going to Home Depot a lot and, you know, you think about a company like that, they have a lot of use cases of why they call. Sometimes they're calling because you came to the store and got some rooms measured for carpet and they're trying to get back in touch with you. Sometimes they're calling you because you ordered something online and it's getting delivered to your home. Sometimes they're calling back because you had a problem with a bill that you received. All those use cases are different. And what we spend a lot of time is walking into businesses and saying, don't worry about the consumer. This technology is going to be intuitive to them. They're going to learn how to use it with a one, one button, just like an iPhone, incredibly quickly. What they're not going to learn really quickly is how to fix all the stuff you got going inside your business that makes it difficult to have the right information in front of an agent in the call flow um, so that when that customer you know, uses this incredibly easy technology for them to understand uh, that you haven't miswired, as you said, your back office systems, and all of the other things that you need to put in place. So a lot of what First to Ryan does is we help the, the businesses adopt this technology, understand the use cases, make sure they've thought through all of the things that they need to do to apply this in a way that gives them a big win when that customer starts seeing it on their phone. And then as I mentioned, the last thing I really wanted to cover here was the overall focus on omni-channel moving forward. So certainly I think what we've been arguing here is that when you think about omni-channel, it's not just a synonym for invest more heavily in digital, it's a synonym for invest more heavily in digital, but also make sure that your voice experience is elite and that everything connects well together. So you provide a lot of great insights about when to call, how to make calls of a higher quality, but how do you see this kind of resulting in a better overall omni-channel journey? What do we need to do to align our voice efforts, outbound or inbound with our digital channel text-based efforts? What do we need to do to make sure that our teams are working together? How ultimately can we use this as a starting point for a better customer journey? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking, Brian. Well, I, you know, as a, uh, I'm a customer, you're a customer. You know, a lot of times we talk about customers as being some sort of foreign thing or a country we're trying to conquer. And, and we all live that life ourselves every day. So it's, it's really important to me as a customer is, uh, if I'm gonna interact a lot with a brand is do they know me? 
And then my second question is, do they care about me? And so when you start talking about that omni-channel experience, one of the things it does when you're consistent with your customers across all these channels, you're showing that number one, you know them, and number two, you care about them. Uh, I can tell you that, that as this technology has been rolling out, some of the rave reviews that brands get from their customers, it's really all about that. Uh, you, 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 sh you, I can tell that you know me, number one, and number two, you care about me. Um, you, you got me my service uh, when, when, I was, when I wanted it. You resolved my customer service problem. Um, you, you know, one of the things that happens in that phone channel, one of the worst things that happens is when you very diligently try to solve a problem for a customer and they never know you tried. So having display technology gives that customer the information, no matter how it eventually gets resolved, that you tried and you're there, there to support them. And, and, and that's really when you open that up to omni-channel, it's like, I want that experience to be, uh, it, it, to be consistent across all those channels. Uh, and, and then the second thing I want is just, you know, service, resolution, a great experience. And unfortunately in the phone channel, that's been a terrible experience for the last few years, but it doesn't have to stay that way. Well, so there you have it. I think ultimately we start with clear goals and those clear goals are one, deliver just an effortless and uh, resolute experience for our customers. But then two, do so while you're demonstrating that you understand who these customers are and you're really committed to solving their problems. And when you do that, you take that mindset and then you think about A, all the channels in which you have to deliver it and then B, what technology is required to make that happen? What processes are required to make that happen? And so we've you know, had plenty of sessions on this online event talking about what that entails in a bot. Here, thanks to Craig, we've had a great insight into what it requires from a phone perspective. When you know that the main reason customers are calling is because they have a clear issue that they haven't been able to get resolved on their own, and they really want to see some accountability and speed, you have to design an experience that takes those into account. And when you follow, whether you're using the first Orion technology, whether you're just thinking about how can I make our, my phone calls more personalized and more productive, that's going to lead to the sense of here's why people are calling and they're getting that why fulfilled. Therefore, they're going to know that you care about them, know that you know them, know that you're committed to a great customer experience. And that's when the value is going to come in. So we're at the end of the session here, Craig. I know we have some questions, which you'll be sure to follow up with via email afterwards. But as we wrap up, any final thoughts for our audience today? Yeah, you know, the only final thought is, is it, for me, in almost any type of technology we talk about, is how are customers responding to it? Uh, at the end of the day, that's what we all care about. That's what we're trying to measure. Uh, and for me, it's really simple. The results go up two to 300%, and that's because customers get it and they use it. And so it's just a category that, that customers are pushing us to not overlook anymore, and they're responding to it. And at the end of the day, that's, that's what we're all looking for in, in all this spending that we're doing with technology. That's exactly it. When you talk about modernizing service experiences, that's the kind of experience you want to be delivering. So thanks so much, Craig. Thanks to First to Ryan. And thanks, of course, to everyone who joined us today. And we'll be back with more CCW Online tomorrow. So looking forward to some more great sessions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brian.